when was the last time you wrote a letter? When was the last time that you received a letter and opened it and physically read the handwritten words on a piece of paper? I remember that when I was in basic training in the army at Fort Benning, Georgia, I remember not having any contact with the outside world and much less the ones who I cared about the most. And I, I do remember that our favorite times of the days were child time, bedtime, and mail call. And I remember the feeling that I got when I did not receive any letters from my friends or family and how that made me feel as if I was left wondering, are they okay? Do they need my help? Or do they even care? And I also remember the overwhelming joy to read the words from a loved one as they were filling me in about their lives and what they were doing, what they were about to do. And now these letters I still have till this day and they're full of love and encouragement. But what if God wrote you a letter? What would it look like? What would it feel like? Would a huge cascade of ethereal fog swoop in as it's being delivered? Would it be shiny? written in gold, and what would it say? What would it say if the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus himself, wrote you a letter? Well, good news, he did. In fact, the entire Bible is one giant love letter. It was written in and through the power of the Holy Spirit as God was speaking through everyday ordinary people. People like John who was taken up into the throne room and was in the presence of the Lord. And Jesus tells John to write these things down. The words that John penned are the very words of Jesus that are in the book of Revelation, and it's where we get the letters to the church. Now, there's a lot of significance to these letters as they mark ages and they speak to the end times, and these were real letters written to real churches. But what do these letters mean for us today? And what do they mean for the church? What do these letters mean for you personally? <laughs> and what if what is said in these letters could change your life forever? Join us for this series, Letters to the Church, as we open the envelope of the book of Revelation and dive into the letters that God has written you. Remember, you got mail. We're here to praise Him, rejoice in His name, and celebrate what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, we're coming down to the end, the very conclusion. We've got one more week of the seven letters to the churches in Asia Minor, which is today modern Turkey. This week, this weekend, we are looking at now the Church of Philadelphia, series number seven. Hope you brought your Bibles with you, turning to chapter three of the book of Revelation. If you did not bring a Bible with you, raise your hand. We have ushers standing by that would love to put a Bible in your hand. Put your hands up high, and they'll bring it to you. That's your Bible to keep, one in the back, one over here, one over there. And uh, don't return them. We want you to use them to study God's holy word. Of course, to, to follow along today with where we're going in this wonderful series. Now, in these seven letters, as we introduced at the very beginning, one of the things that we want to do is to really identify what a church is supposed to be like, what a church should be doing. And in fact, when we again talk about the church, if you're a guest with us for the first time, we're not talking about Cornerstone as a building, although Cornerstone is a ministry. But as I look out at the audience of all of our services and those folks online, I'm talking to you today. If you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, born again, you are the church, the ecclesia, the set apart for a purpose. Every one of us has a purpose. And quite honestly, there are some things that we're all to be doing not just in our own talents and our gifts, but purposes that God has given us, but some very specific things. And one of the things that we learned is, is what should a church be doing and how should a church be teaching? And then it gives you the opportunity to say, this is the church I really think I belong, or maybe this isn't the church I belong at. And that's the purpose. But no matter what, let's look at what the guidelines are and what it means to us as believers. Because one of the things that we do at Cornerstone, and we pray all blood-bought, Christ-centered churches, they preach the Word of God. It's not watered down. It's exactly what God's Word says. Now remember, don't just take my word for it. Don't take any of our teachings team's word for it. The Bible instructs us to test the Spirit. You had every right to, to test what I'm saying. Look at God's Word and begin to study. Ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate your heart and your mind so that you would know that what I'm saying is of God or not. And that's totally understandable. Now, what we want to do is look at this church, Philadelphia, to whom Jesus writes this letter. And it's a unique letter because it's one of only two churches that receive no condemnation. 
No negative comments. The uh, first church was the church of Smyrna. It did not receive any negative complaints from the Lord Jesus. And the church of Philadelphia. And so last week, as I said, I was going to figure out how to take a, a negative message and turn it into positive. Because the church that we looked at last week is not a lot of good church, right? But not this church. This church is very positive. There's something so unique about this church. There's something so unique about being a part of a church like Philadelphia because in Philadelphia was a church of born-again believers and they had a purpose and their purpose was just just one more. Just one more what? Just one more soul. That's what, we all, that's what we've been about since our ministry started in 1999. If you look at our mission and our vision statement, our mission is, we, or the vision is we see the kingdom growing lives, changing people, loving and serving because they have been with Jesus. Our mission statement is so simple. Win the lost, disciple the one, and to care for the community. That's who we are. That's what we're all about. And the first part of what Philadelphia was all about was this one thing, to win souls. Now, why would we want for the life of us to win souls to the Lord Jesus Christ? For the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn very quickly though, over to Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Because the wisest man had something to say, Solomon, by way of the Holy Spirit. And here's what he says in chapter 11, verse 30. He who wins souls is wise. He who wins souls is what? Is what? Wise. So when you win souls, you are wise. That's the kind of church we want to be a part of. Uh, yes, discipleship is so important. Yes, small groups are so important. I could just go through a list of things, but winning souls is very important. Winning souls for the kingdom. And a church that wins souls is a wise church. Again, Cornerstone's just a building and a ministry. We're talking to those here today, wherever you're from and from Cornerstone and online. If you know Jesus, you're to be winning souls. Now, like these other churches that we've looked at, Asia Minor, there's some things that we need to talk about. One of these things is why win souls? We just declared that. One of the things we heard yesterday in our conference, and it's something we say very regular here, if you cannot define Jesus in two minutes in witnessing, we need to talk to you today because remember, you're called to witness. And so maybe you're here today and you go, what does it mean to win souls? Well, to win souls is to tell people about Jesus Christ and what God's love has done for us that he will do for you. And that is when you accept Jesus Christ as the propitiation, the satisfaction, and the substitute, and we accept him as Lord and Savior according to Matthew 10, 32, and 33. The Holy Spirit resides within us. We become baptized. We accept the Lord. We confess his name. And we become part of the family. Our sins are forgiven forevermore. Past, present, and future. We have a home in heaven. A forever father. And of course the Bible tells us there are many mansions in his house. If it were not so, he wouldn't have told you. He is preparing a place for those that know the Lord. That's what it means to win souls. Now, like I said, with Asia Minor, there's got to be a little bit of a background about these churches. We've done that with every church. Um, this particular church, Philadelphia, is about 125 miles inland, 30 miles to 35 miles southeast of the church of Smyrna, Sardis, I'm sorry. Now, Philadelphia is a brand new city. That's what pretty much separates this church from all the other churches and cities. It's brand new, a new city, but it becomes a crucial city. And it's established for one particular purpose, this city. The city is designed to bring in not only the Roman Empire, the Roman culture under uh, the Greek, it's Greek, it's Greek influence, but all these roads that come in from Rome, north to south, east to west, they all verge right into this one place on purpose, strategically in the city of Philadelphia. So it's a growing fast city, and their purpose is to be missionaries not to the church, but to the city, so in turn they could spread the geek, Greek geek, how about that, the Greek culture further out. And that was the purpose of it. So it's a very unique strategic location. And when Jesus writes this letter, we know that Jesus knows everything anyway. He knows our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. He knows what's going on today, tomorrow. He knew in advance about the city of Philadelphia. And so it makes sense for him to write to this group of people who are now going to start a church. But like other churches where these places were built in those days, there were pagan temples. They had the same thing throughout Philadelphia. Pagan temples everywhere. But they had some unusual customs that are in Philadelphia that will come to bear on this message that I want you to remember. Sometimes 
when an outstanding citizen would do something for another person, buy them a gift, buy them a horse buggy, whatever it might be, the city wanted to recognize that person, and what they would do is they would make a pillar with their name on it, and that will come to bear in this message. And then the entire city would know about this person for the good that they've done in the city. They'd have their own pillar with their own name in it, and it would be placed in these pagan temples. People were so excited about that. And so another thing that takes place that has a bearing on this message a little bit later is it's interesting to note that in Philadelphia, though it was a new city, there are volcanoes everywhere, one particular volcano. And in A.D. 17, uh, the volcano exploded. And when it did, it caused people to rush and run out of the city. And so because they ran out of the city, they had to leave their things behind. And as the city was rebuilt, they weren't allowed to come back in the city except for goods and supplies and food. So they had to go in and they had to go out. It was a constant shuffling of in and out. The city was always volatile because nature was ready to cause a major problem. Now, this is so important because when you think about a city, as I said to you last week, it's important about the city and about the church. And the same thing is here. What's interesting, as you study church history about Philadelphia, it played such a key role because it was the last stronghold for the Christian faith over in that part of the world. You got to get your mind wrapped around the very last stand of the Jews who were at Masada trying to hold out for the very last moment. At Masada, we've been there. It's an amazing place. And you can just see the battleground and how they tried to hold on before the great defeat. This was the last stronghold of Christianity in that part of the world. Because remember, Jesus had started a church there. He had planted a church right in the city. And it was amazing what happened, obviously. The battle took place. It was a massive crusade. And in that crusade, obviously, the, the Muslims, Islam, came in and wiped out most of the Christianity, wiped out most of the people. In the 13th century, there was another crusade now, what's said today is, is that you still see the ruins of Philadelphia. Nothing's been moved. There is still one Byzantine church there. And some historians and some theologians tell us that there are a few Christians there. You know, you hear that term remnant. There's a remnant over there. But if you go over to Turkey today, you don't have religious freedom like we do. And so what they have to do is they have to go underground to be a part of the way or to celebrate and to learn about Jesus Christ. So that kind of gives you a historical view. The name of the town Philadelphia is not Philadelphia no more. It's called Al Lashari. That's the name of it. Al Lashari in Turkey. So a missionary city, strategically located, a city that the Lord now is going to take a church and plant. And we begin to see what's happening with that church. And as I said last week, imagine. As you prepared today to hear about Philadelphia, imagine the church Philadelphia themselves. They've heard that they're going to get a letter. They heard that Sardis got a letter. They heard that Thyatira got a letter. All these people got, and they're, they're, they're sitting on the edge of the seat, and the pastor says, next weekend, we're going to read that letter. And they had to be nervous because they had heard about Sardis. It didn't go too well for Sardis, right? And so they're kind of anticipating, are we going to get, like, sidelined here? Are we going to get the same thing that these other churches have gone through? But that's not what happens. Hopefully your Bibles are open to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Starting in verse 7, we're going to do a verse by verse, as we generally do in our teachings. But I'm not going to read the whole thing this morning. We're just going to go verse by verse and, and begin to understand why Philadelphia got planted and why we want to be a Philadelphia church. Let me ask you this. Are you a Philadelphian Christian? Are you... A Philadelphian Christian. You see, because of this church being planted here, the very first thing that we begin to see is the character of Christ. You notice in these letters that every time Jesus writes, he says something about his character. He says something about his attributes. Now, quite honestly, we could not spend enough time in years to talk about his characteristics and attributes. Stephen Charnock wrote a book in 1736, 1636 that speaks about it. It's just a massive book talking about that. But notice in verse 7 what it says here. He says, these things says he who is holy, who is true. Two words right here that describe, describe his characteristics. These 
attributes that he has. He tells something about himself. Yeshua says, I am holy. In other words, this refers to his purity. The, the Lord is absolutely pure. There's not a blemish on him. Do you remember when Pontius Pilate had him standing before him? And what did he say? He says, I can find no sin, no fault, no anything. This man is perfect. He is pure. Now, there's a great deal of discussion that's ramping up again, and you'll see it as we get closer to the end times of these churches ramping up and people ramping up with false messiahs and all of that kind of stuff and church leaders coming on the scene and speaking about themselves and glorifying their name rather than God. I would say that if you study history, you need to study church history of other churches. Very important to understand about the founders of these other churches because when you study the founders of other churches, religions, other churches, study history, and you'll find that there's a lot of character flaws in them. In fact, almost every leader that I've ever studied had a character flaw. But notice this, when you study the Gospels, you will find not one thing said negative about Jesus. Remember, the Bible is his story. It's history. It's accounts of this man that was called Yeshua, who became Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. He was perfect. He was pure. He was absolutely beautiful. And he still is. But not only is he pure, the Bible says that he is true. I am true. In other words, I'm the real thing. I'm the genuine article. Now, remember, we said truth is that which corresponds to reality. If, if I was to say to you that this is a oversized violin, right? I'm trying to convince you of that right now. That guitar pick fell, right? Is that truth or is that reality? It's not a violin, is it? It's a trumpet. No, it's a, what is it? It's a guitar. Truth corresponds to reality. And everything about Jesus Christ is real. He says, I am true. There is nothing more true in me, no, nothing more genuine than me. He says, I'm the real thing. And so if you're looking for the real thing, this is where you find it with Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So maybe you're here today and you think there's another way to get to God. There's another way to get to heaven. There's another way to get your sins forgiven. You've got to go through these saints. You've got to go through Mary. You've got to go through all these. Let me tell you, there is no way that you can be saved. There is no name above heaven on earth or below by which a man can be saved except by the name of Jesus Christ. And if you've not confessed Jesus Christ as your uh, Lord and Savior, this is the day. It's right now. Don't wait. Confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. He says, I'm real. I'm truth. I'm the life. I'm the way. Notice, though, as we look at this, he goes a little bit further. Not just his attributes. He talks about his activity. Continuing in verse 7. He says, I am he who holds the key to David or your translation might say, has the key to David. Very important verse here. In fact, as you study the church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia is known as the only true Jewish church. More descriptions are given about Philadelphia as a Jewish Christian than any other churches. Five things that the Lord mentions. We're just going to look at a few of them, but this is one of them. He has the key of David. Now, if you study the Bible, you'll find that in Isaiah 22, 22, there is something that ties into this. And in Isaiah 22, 22, it talks about a man who stood by the king with a set of keys. And the reason the man was always with King David, with the keys, he had the keys to the treasury. He was the one that was allowed to open up the king's treasure so all could see or whatever needed to be handed out by the authority of King David. Jesus says, I'm not only that guy, I'm the one who holds the keys. I'm the key keeper. I'm the, oh wait, that's my last name. I'm, yeah. It was funnier last night, okay? Maybe I, maybe I missed something. He is the key. He holds the keys. I mean, it's important to meet a lot of people who have keys to businesses, keys to cars, keys to... There is no one more important than this man, Jesus Christ. He has the key to everything. For instance, he has the key to salvation. In the opening verses of chapter 1 of Revelation 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am forevermore. Amen. Now watch this. And I have the keys of Hades and death. In other words, Jesus has the keys to salvation. There's a 
Another good reason to understand what key he has. He's the only one that has the keys to remove sin, to let a sinner come through the door. John 10, 9, I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That is the good news. That he has the door that he opens by key to the way of salvation. And I say again, in the name of Jesus Christ, we invite you today that if you've not confessed Jesus before men, if you've not completed your act of salvation by confessing him openly, if you've not been baptized into the watery graves to arise and walk before this day is out, that needs to be done. We were so thrilled last night to watch two young people confess Jesus and then to be baptized by their father. I love seeing when that happens. He has the key. But the truth is, is the door will not always be open. It's open right now, but it won't always be open. You remember the story of Noah? Great story. So Noah had an invitation. In fact, the whole world at the time had an invitation to join Noah on the ark, right? And so people followed, but it was just his family. And if you recall, Jesus is standing at the door and he invites Noah in. God himself, what happens? The Bible says that he shuts the door. It is sealed. No one can open a door that God has shut. And so the door is not always going to be open. It's open now, but who knows when it's going to be closed. And so that's why I'm saying if you've not confessed Jesus, don't wait. You say, I'm young, I'm vigorous, i got a whole life ahead of me. How do you know that? Well, if I get sick, I'll have a deathbed confession. How do you know you're going to get that chance of a deathbed confession? You're playing with fire, heaven or hell. That's how serious this is. And he says, this door is open. I've given you an opportunity, he says, to walk through the door before I shut it. So don't wait. He's the keeper of the keys. He can shut, he can open, he can do whatever he wants. Now notice in verse 8, he goes a little bit further. I've set before you this open door. Now he's, he's switching gears a little bit. Before he's talking about salvation, now he's back to the church. I've got an open door for you. And I want you to take the opportunity to tell other people about Jesus. That's what I want you to do. That's what I've called you to do. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Yeshua. By the power of the Holy Spirit that rests in you, you're called to go witness and tell other people about Jesus before that door shuts. Imagine the opportunities that you're missing out on today or yesterday or this weekend, wherever you were. Maybe you're on the, uh, over your disappearing island on your boat. People all around that you could have told. How many people do you see every day that you wonder, are they going to go to heaven or hell? Does that even phase you? Your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your uncle. What are you doing? You know, I believe that when the Lord returns and takes his people out of here, the Bible says we're going to have a tear. I've always believed that reason we're going to have a tear. We're going to look back at all the people that we left behind, a chance to witness to them. And that door will be closed. And the character of Christ is so holy and true. He implores us. He calls upon us as the church to tell other people about Jesus. So let's look at the other thing, the control of Christ. The control of Christ. This letter, we begin to understand what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be a follower, what it is to understand who holds the keys. Now, there's three verses to look at very quickly. Verse 8, verse 9, and verse 11. If you have a King James, it'll probably match up a little bit better to you, but we used a different Bible. Now I was going to say something. Right? Um, in King James, the word is behold, 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 behold. Uh, if you're using the New King James Revision or the RSAV, uh, a couple other translations, you're going to see three words at the beginning. C, S, E, E, the word indeed, and the word behold. They all kind of tie in the same thing. And I want you to notice what, what Jesus is saying here in verse 8. C, I have set before you, church, an open door. That means that we as Christians are under his control. He has set before us an opportunity. Now remember, he's writing to the church of Philadelphia in the first century, this Christian church. There are believers inside the church. And the letter as it's being read by the angel of that church, the pastor of that church is saying, we're under his control, are we not? And the church responds, yes. Now why did he want the church, the Christians under, again, people are coming from everywhere. The city is rapidly growing. 
fast and people are going through and seeing the church of Philadelphia and they're telling people about Jesus. And he reminds them, I've set this door before you. But here's what's really interesting. Verse 8 takes a shift and it says, for you have little strength. Now, that throws some people for a curve. It's really interesting what he's talking about here. For you have little strength. I've studied Prash. I've studied uh, Flaherty. I've studied uh, Dr. Beckford. There's so many. To, I, I wanted to really get an understanding of this. What, what does this mean? And it, it was really interesting because I had somebody ask me a few days ago, how many people attend Cornerstone or part of Cornerstone? I said, do you want the bragging number or the ones that show up, right? That went over better last night too, man, I'm telling you. I mean, we, we cannot say that we're a small little church. I'm thankful that we're not. We're a mid-sized church and we just keep growing. This was a, a, a little church, few in number, few in strength. Now, unfortunately, in most churches today, there's a very minor appeal, unfortunately. We, we've been known as evangelistic church. That's who we are, but there's not a lot of people involved in soul winning. Because I think a lot of people think that's my job. It's not my job. It's your job. And if I'm sitting in the audience and Pastor Josh is preaching or one of our elders is preaching or Dr. Love is here preaching, uh, it's my job with you because I'm the church. I'm the called out to tell people. But it just doesn't happen. You see, the people that are truly involved in the soul winning become a real backbone of the growth of the church for the glory of God because we want people to know what we know. I mean, we have the greatest cure for life evermore. And I have to believe there's a lot of people out here today that are born again that know Jesus. Think about that. Sins are forgiven. Going to live forever in the presence of God. Enjoying fellowship and things that we, our minds can't even grasp. Why wouldn't you want to share that with other people? And yet we don't have enough people that do that. If you want to do that, I would encourage you today or tomorrow to call our administration office. And Lynn or Vicki will hook you up with me or Josh, and we'll begin the journey with you to talk about how to win souls. You, don't, you say, well, I'm not real good at winning souls. Well, just invite him to church. Just have him come to church, and guess what we'll do? We'll sing, we'll pray, we'll teach the word, we'll laugh a little, we'll rejoice, we'll be happy in the Lord, let the Holy Spirit do the rest. All right? I, can't do, I cannot get anybody to... The Holy Spirit has to move. The Holy Spirit is the one that has to convict. The Holy Spirit is... I, we're just tools, vessels, plant a seed, okay? So just bring them to church, invite them to church. Some people say, well, I, I, you preach a little hard. Your team, yeah, we preach the Bible. You know, the Bible can be offensive. Jesus' word is offensive. He even said to a group of guys that was following him, hey, you want to keep following me? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. We're out of here. <laughs> Jesus wasn't interested in numbers. He was interested in change. And too many churches today are watering down the gospel message so you can feel real good. That's just not going to happen here. Hearts need to be pierced. Eyes need to be opened. Christ needs to be glorified. And he needs to be in control of your life. Man, if I could just get, if we could just get, I was looking for our evangelist, he's in the other service, just get a handful of more people. All the people that you're going to bypass tomorrow. Hey, come to Cornerstone, wacky preacher. <laughs> Hey, great, great praise. I mean, there's just, they're stripped down and basic. Maybe you know how to evangelize. Maybe you know how to tell somebody in two minutes about Jesus Christ. But how many people will you come in contact this week? How many people did you last week and you never said a word about Jesus? It makes no difference to me, but the one that you say lives within you, it makes a big difference to him, right? That's so important to understand because if you know Jesus, we've said before, all your sins are forgiven. There's not going to be any screen that's going to be pulled down even for the Philadelphian church, and all your sins are on display for the world. That's not going to happen because the blood of Jesus has covered you past, present, and future. But he is going to bring a ledger out on you. What did you do for my Jesus? What did you do with my Jesus? With your time, your talent, and your treasure. Do you know Jesus? Here's the bottom line. When this life is over, it doesn't matter how many cars you had, how much money you had, what your title was, how many friends you had, how popular you were. What matters when this life is over and it will end is where you will be, heaven or hell. There is no in between. And if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you follow Christ Jesus, you desire to be obedient to Christ Jesus, 
He's going to bring that ledger out of time, town, and treasure. And one of those questions is, what did you do with the name of Jesus? We should be under His control. You should be involved in ministry if you're part of the church. If you're part of another church, then go back and say, I want to serve somewhere. We're called to serve. We got 125 volunteers on the weekend that are serving right now. You only get to see a small part of the hundreds upon hundreds, almost a thousand people. It takes, and we need more. You want to serve? We got three services. I don't know how many small groups we have. I have no any idea uh, how many missions we have anymore. We're a global minded, local minded, strategic, laying out missions, not only overseas, but here. So those missionaries can tell people about Jesus and we can tell people about Jesus and we can save babies from being murdered. Can I get an amen? We take it serious. I could just list so much and we're praying for you. Oh, you of little strength. Philadelphians, you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. A church that wins souls does not deny the name of Jesus or anything in the scripture or water it down. We are a church that preaches Jesus. So if you want to know about Jesus, you're going to get to hear a lot about Jesus. That's what the Bible tells us. It's a lot. It's all about Jesus. We believe the word of God. We will not deny the word of God. And that's the kind of church I think people ought to be a part of. Uh, verse 9. Indeed. He switches from C to indeed. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but they lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. You see, the church of Philadelphia had an opposition. It had its critics. I want you to get this. The devil has churches too. In fact, today, the, there's some churches that are meeting that are authored and overseen by Satan. You can name a town. I mean, I'll never forget when we were in Lake Helen launching a pilot church. We had them showing up with tarot cards and crystals, doing some kind of whatever they do. We just looked in their face and laughed. There are churches throughout the community that are purposely put in place to glorify Satan and not God. And I'm not saying that's don't, I'm not saying they're out there. But they're there. That's what he's saying here. And if they were in Philadelphia, they're going to be in Cornerstone and there's going to be opposition. Listen, I don't know if you know there's not. Cornerstone gets a lot of critic, criticism coming at it. It has for a long time. I mean, as this church started in 99 or 23 people and then started growing and growing and growing. And they said, they're doing something down there. There's some magic water. There's a cult. There's some. When you, know, when you start winning souls for the kingdom, it throws everybody off. What are they doing? We're not doing anything. Preaching Jesus, him crucified. That's what it's called to do. And so expect criticism here at Cornerstone for those that are part of the body. The devil doesn't want this church to be known. I want to be known in hell. We want to be a church that's known in hell. Now think about that. And I'll exegete that on another Sunday. Confess Christ as Lord and Savior. Rejoice in who he is. Be a soul winner. Look at the third word in verse 11. Behold. Now it comes right after. The, behold comes right after verse 10. Now watch this. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the ire of trial. Now what I want to do very quickly is cut through the doctrine, a lot of doctrine here, and say this, that the Bible teaches there's going to come a time of such trouble that has never been seen on earth. You want to put in your margins, Matthew 24, 21. And this is from the lips of our Lord himself. It is the great tribulation. There's going to be an unprecedented time of trouble. Now, I recognize as I do this very quickly, there is a majority of people here today and last night's service and in today's service and probably online that are going to disagree with me. I just want you to know I'm right and you're wrong. Settle that right now. That's just, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, here's what's important. If you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, some of these eschatological values in times, they'll just fall in place. They're not essential. For those of you that disagree with me, I believe you're going to sweat a little bit. I'm not. But we need to understand what's going on here. Why he says, I will keep you. So let's just move rapidly through this. Remember, there are going to be people dwelling on earth and there's going to be a time such has never been seen before. And what about the Christians? 
What about the believers? He says, I will keep you from that hour of trial. That word keep is a unique word. It is a Greek word. The word is taureo, T-E-R-E-O. It is to guard. It is to protect. It is to watch over. This word keep is taureo. is throughout the Bible. Probably one of the unique ones that I found as I studied this word study is in Genesis 6, starting in verse 19. Remember when Noah, we'll come back to that illustration a couple of times. Um, God commands Noah to bring the animals into the ark all two by two and then bring in the sacrificial ones and then bring in the ones that are going to need to live. And what's he say to him? He says, Noah, I instruct you to keep. Now, when you study that in the Greek, what he's saying is, I'm instructing you to keep them alive, protect them, guard them, watch over them. Why? Well, remember, he's been placed inside the ark and it's been sealed, and now he has been covered. But was he taken out? No, he rode that crazy storm. Violent, shaking, earth moving. God kept the believer. God kept those that were inside the ark safe. I will watch over you. I will protect you. When you go through the Bible and begin to see the word keep, 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 it is tereo. That other word, probably the word from, ought to be translated a little bit differently. I will tereho you. I will keep you out of this time of trouble. Now, some of you were at the conference yesterday, and I want to labor you. I did not know he was going to be sharing some of the things that I was going to be teaching, but they kind of go hand in hand. But again, remember, you test the spirits. You do not take my word because I know there are people here. Some are pre-trib, some are mid-trib, some are post-trib. I'm a pan-trib. It'll all pan out. Don't worry about it, right? No, it's not true. You can ask me later what my position is. But he says, there's going to come a time the trouble's so great, going to be placed in the ark, but you're going to be sealed and I'm going to keep you, protect you, watch over you out of this time of trouble. Now, this is the reference for the believer because he says he's going to protect us during this difficult time. Do you think these are difficult times now? Church, like Bachman Turner Overdrive used to say, but baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get more difficult. Now, I do believe the church is going to leave here. Every born again child of God We'll come out of this world one of these days. But while we wait, particularly through this great awakening, there is going to come a day where he takes us home. But I believe while we're here, he will protect us, keep us from trouble. But I can't help believe, too, that the coming of the Lord is very close. Closer every single day. The, the more I read the news, the more I align world events with the Bible, you begin to see this culmination of the age is coming together for a big, messy, cataclysmic. And we will be out of here. The question is, where does that all fall? That's another story. But there's a better way, and that's Jesus. Amen? Let's just go on real quick. Verse 11 ends. Behold, I come quickly. Do you know what that means? I come quickly. <laughs> Behold, I come quickly. I come quickly. Actually, the, the rendering of that is suddenly. That, I'm not talking about imminence. Boom. Like I, I'm talking about blink your eye. That's how fast it's going to be. In other words, when the church is raptured out of here, boom, I come that fast. Like a blinking. Behold, I come quickly. Now watch this. Hold fast to what you have. Talking to the church. Talking to you. Hold fast to what you have. And not talking about your possessions. They don't belong to you anyway. You think they do, but they don't. They belong to God. You're a steward, a manager, a caretaker, a keeper. That's why he says to do certain things with the time, the talent, and treasure, starting with your tithe and your time and then your talent. Hold fast to what you have. Now, here's what you lose. That no one may take your crown. Now, here's what I believe. This is what I believe. If you're, if you're truly saved, born again, you don't lose your salvation. I, I just don't believe that. I don't believe that there's, if you confess Christ... Holy Spirit's living in you. He's sealed. I don't know how you get the Holy Spirit out. Plus, Paul says it's an irrevocable gift. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose something. And in this case, you lose your crown. Now, I don't know what crowns you have. If you need to study those in the Bible, do them. There are seven crowns. You might get all seven. You might only get one, but you don't want to have none. Because those crowns get laid at the feet of Jesus. And we'll see that become a diadem for him. Whoo! But he said to Philadelphian church, the Philadelphian church, the cornerstone church, 
No, you won't lose your salvation, but if you are not so winning, you'll not only never have that crown, but that crown will never get to you again. You don't want that. And it may be another crown. I, again, I, I don't know. The, the crown of uh, irrepe- irrepressible life. I don't know. But I know what he's talking about here. And so the closer we get to the end times, we ought to be telling people more about Jesus. Witnessing. Telling them how much he loves you and what he's done for you in your life and about the home that you'll have in heaven. Here's the last thing. They were understanding the conquest of Christ. In these closing verses, verse 12 and 13, he talks about this conquest. And here's what he says. He says, I will. In every one of these letters, this is used, I will. He closes with with these messages about overcoming to those who conquer. In other words, we conquer. We conquer in Jesus' name. We we, We can't do anything on our own. We think we can, but the minute we begin to understand that we're operating in the Holy Spirit, things begin to change. Even Paul wrote this in Romans 8, 37. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our conquest and our conquer is because of what Christ has conquered, and it is his conquest. It's his battle. We're servants. And then he says, goes on in verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him here. We're coming back now to the very opening of what they did in Philadelphia. Because this is so important because people today and the world comes into the church. So but people really want to be recognized by other people. People love to get patted on their back for well done. I, I, I've never been that way. And that's, I'm, I'm here for an audience of one. I want the applause of Christ, not you, okay? And you should want the same thing. But what he's saying to the church, what he's saying to Cornerstone, what he's saying to you, I love this, watch this. If you overcome, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, his father, and you'll show, you'll show, go out no more. And I love this. These church, this church, the Philadelphian church, was so small, so burdened, but so on fire for the Lord. And they're watching all these people get their names placed inside the secular temples. Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Bobby Sue, or whoever. And the church is seeing that. But that church realized, big deal, one day, My name's going to be ascribed on a pillar in the temple of God. To me, that is more exciting. Listen, we're only here for a short time, and it's moving fast. And for those of you that get a certain generation, we know we're on countdown. The kids, it goes fast, like a blink of an eye. And the older you get, it's a theory out there that we could talk about it later, but time does move faster the older you get. My son was on stage with me yesterday, and I hadn't stood side to side. I said, Tyler, and he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's an older guy. I said, are you, getting, are you getting taller? He said, no, Dad, you're getting shorter. I didn't even realize. I, had, I used to be six foot and just a little over. I think I'm about 5'11". It's just a bummer. But never mind. I will make him. I will make Sue. I will make Kevin. I will make George. I will make Paul. I will make Jamie. I will make Mike. I will make Jesse. I will make Martha. I'll make them a pillar in the temple of my God and they shall go out no more. Remember, volcano chased them out and most of their life they were in and out and in and out, but not no more. God says, come on in. Here's your pillar and you don't have to leave this home ever again. Don't worry about the volcanoes. Don't worry about the tribulation. Don't worry. It's going to be a mess. But persevere. Hold on. Get ready. Share the gospel. Tell others. You're an outstanding citizen for the kingdom of God. I hope that's what you believe and that you want to be. Quit running in and out of this world. Quit having one foot in the world and one foot in the church and get on fire for the Lord and watch what he does and how he molds that and shapes us. I have a lot of fun in this world. I'm a weird guy. But I love God. I love Jesus. I love the Holy Spirit. I love church. He's wired me a certain way. But I'm happy. I get sad at times. I have burdens. We all have them. We're going to get a few more very soon, unfortunately. But be happy in the Lord. Rejoice. Become a pillar for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, I love this. I will make you a pillar. Make you. Make you. Catch that word. Do you remember the prodigal son? In two weeks, we're going to do a journey together, five, six weeks, on the parables. We're going to pick some parables to talk about, some ones that are really difficult to understand and bring them to life. Remember when uh, the prodigal son left his father? What did he say? Give me. That's what a lot of people say. Give me. You come to church. Give me. 
Bad way to think. But when he gets to his father, what's he say? All translations, make me. He's no longer saying, give me, make me. We're the, we're the clay, he's the potter. How to allow the Holy Spirit to shape you this very moment. Let him, I mean, if you're tired of running your own life, here's what drives me crazy. There are people, you take everybody's inventory, but yourself. I counsel enough of you. Well, here's what she said. Here's what she did. Here's what he did. You better worry about your own inventory. And today would be the day to say, make me, not someone else. If you do make it to heaven, you will not be going in with your partner. I've been to Jerusalem. The gate's too narrow. They did it for a purpose. You're going in by yourself. So right now you say, Lord, I'm tired of running. I'm tired of going my direction. I'm tired of trying to figure this whole thing out. God, make me your vessel. God, change me. You can't do that unless you operate in tandem with the Holy Spirit. Let's start closing this up. He goes on and says, I will write on him the name of my God, the name of my city, the city of my God. And then I will write upon him my new name. <sighs> Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting. That's who we know him as. But we're going to see something we've never seen before, a new name. He has a name that no one knows. And he says, I'm going to write that on him and her. Do you remember when the Queen of Sheba went to Solomon? And she looked out and she says, only the half of everything's been told. Beyond anything I've ever seen, it must have been mind-boggling what the Queen of Sheba had seen. The Bible says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has in store for us, except by the Spirit who whets our appetite just a bit that gives us a glimpse of what's in store for us. I mean, I got a, I got a small glimpse of what it's going to be like in heaven, but it's small. There's so much that I can't get my mind wrapped around, but I want to see it all. I want to see every bit of it. I mean, we've been recently seeing new photography of 500 trillion light years away and it blows me away to see what God and that's just a little bit of it no eye has seen no ear has heard but if you're here today and you've never confessed Christ you will not see and you will not hear the splendors of heaven but the gnashing and the gnawing of teeth where the worm never dies where the sulfur smells where the body burns and the pain is constant if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior this is the hour. Today is the day. It's why we preach the way we preach. I found a quote by Charles Finney. It's an old country preacher. He said this, Lord, it's time for our church to wake up, speak up, pray up, preach up, and to never give up or to let up or back up or shut up until the church is filled and we're all caught up. That day is fast approaching. The Bible tells us very clearly in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you'll confess Jesus, before men in this generation, I'll confess you before my father the next. But if you will not confess me before men, this is that hour. You've never said, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. He is the Christ. It is not Jesus Christ. It is Jesus the Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I, de I desire to live for him the whole days of my life. This great confession that Peter gave. But he goes on in verse 33. He says, if you won't confess me here, I will not confess you there. If you're ashamed of me here, I'll be ashamed of you for the Father. That's just as simple as I can put it. Maybe you confess Jesus, but you've never been immersed. Biblical baptism. What the Bible teaches to be lowered into the watery grave to arise and walk in newness of life. Whatever decision you need to make. Maybe it's just to pray where you're at. Maybe it's to talk to one of our decision guides. Front and back. How'd you like me doing that? Front and back. I got one more of these to go through. This is that time to make that decision today for Jesus. As we stand and sing this hymn of invitation, would you come?